Once again, our gospel lesson is found on page 6, if you'd like to follow along for our sermon text today. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 13, and verse 16. John writes, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to be a mighty king, so enemies beware. I'm going to be the main event like no king was before. No one to say do this, no one saying be there, no one saying stop that, no one saying see here. Free to run around all day, free to do it my way. Just when I promised that the Disney quotes would end, I have another one for you guys. Those words were spoken by the soon-to-be king of the rock, Simba. You see, Simba didn't know what it was like to be king, but he knew that it was better. It was better than what he had. You know, he wasn't saying that his dad, Mufasa, the current king, was a bad king, but life was going to be a whole lot better when he took over the throne from his dad, and he could have it his way. Right? Look at, look at those lyrics again. Right? He, he doesn't need to answer to anybody because everyone answers to him. He doesn't have anyone that's the boss over him because he is the boss. He doesn't have anyone looking at his schedule and okaying certain things and denying other things because he can do whatever he well pleases. Because he is king. Maybe you've heard that phrase before, it's good to be king. Today we're going to talk about that. And as Christians, in all reality, we don't say that. We say something better. Not it's good to be king, but it's good that Jesus is king. It's good that Jesus is king and I am not. It's good that Jesus is king and not someone else. Because today we're going to also talk about how Jesus is a king unlike any other. Jesus takes of the, the idea of king and what it means to be king and totally flips it upside down, turns it on its head, shows us what a true king, what a perfect king really looks like. When you think about that, if anyone else was the king, or if we had it our way and we were a king, imagine how things would go. Well, according to our sinful nature, we'd serve our own self-interest first. We'd make sure that our bellies are full, and if there's anything left over for the common man, then sure. Let's make sure I'm taken care of first and let everyone else be second or last. Let them eat cake, right? But Jesus takes that idea and flips it on its head. The one who is perfect and holy and righteous and the only one that is, the only entity, the only example, the only real one that is perfect in every way, that is above and beyond every name, is the most humble one of us all. The one who has all servants at his feet if he wanted to, is the servant of all. The one who has all power, all authority at his fingertips, in heaven and on earth, only uses his power for our eternal good? That's the king. That's the King of Kings, that's the Lord of Lords, and that is our King, Jesus Christ, that is going into Jerusalem and that is being praised and honored on this Palm Sunday. And that's the King that you and I follow, that you and I serve, and that you and I praise, because that is the King that has saved us. As we gather together this Holy Week, we celebrate the King of Kings and Lord of Lords unlike any other and we're going to go through some tough times. We're going to see him going through some uncertain things. But the verses that are in front of us today are going to remind us who that king is, what he's doing for us, and reminds us that this king is in control of all things. 
This king sets the plans into motion for our Holy Week as the verses begin. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Crazy, right? Crazy as we look at those verses. Crazy, but not coincidence. Think about it. This parade that took place on that first Palm Sunday was unplanned. It was this impromptu party that was thrown in response to Jesus the King coming towards Jerusalem. The people didn't know about it. They, they didn't know weeks in advance. They couldn't prep for it. They didn't have it on their calendar with daily reminders knowing that it was going to happen. But there was one that did know. There was one that had been planning all along for this day to come, and that was the king. <clears throat> he knew that this was going to happen, and he set those plans in motion. So he called forward two of his disciples and sent them on a mission. And of course, we don't know exactly what that looked like, but I was thinking to myself, you think about the disciples and how almost all of them were the first ones to jump at an opportunity to be in the spotlight. Or to be the one. And I imagine as Jesus is giving the instructions for this mission, each one of the disciples steps back further and further from him. Right? Because look at the mission. Two of you are going to go into a town that you don't know. And you're going to find an animal that isn't yours, and you're going to take it from someone that you don't know, and they're going to ask about it, and all you're going to say is, the Lord needs it. And they might have thought to themselves, Jesus, are you trying to pick a fight here? You, what, what are you doing? But they go, and they listen, and they trust, and we see what happens. Sentence after sentence, word after word, exactly as Jesus said it would happen, it does. Don't miss that. This isn't circumstance. This isn't just luck. This wasn't Jesus going at midnight on a little scavenger hunt or on a spy chase the night before to check things out, and it just so happened to work out. No, Jesus knew exactly what would happen. Jesus didn't say, go to a town and find something for me to ride. Like if I said to you, go to Neosho or go to Web City and find a red car on the square and bring that to me. Chances are there's going to be a red car parked there. No, he said, find a donkey that's tied up, that has never been ridden before, and bring it to me. And when they ask what you're doing, simply say, the Lord needs it. A great reminder for all of us of the omniscience and the omnipotence of our God. The king that we have that is all-powerful and all-knowing. That power and that knowledge that's displayed right here, don't overlook it. Because it sets into motion the events that happen every single one of these days of Holy Week. And it reminds us of that power and that knowledge that was at work in all of the days before this, going back to the beginning. Because like I said... There are going to be times during this week where you throw your hands in the air and ask your king, what is going on? You might be thinking to yourself that this king has unknowingly went into an ambush, that this king is failing, that this king is being defeated, that this king has totally lost it. But a great reminder right off the bat here, Jesus knows, Jesus has planned Jesus has organized every single one of these events according to his plan. He knows what needs to happen to save us. Do you notice the animal there that was picked? The donkey? Not an animal that usually gets many pages on our Bibles or the history books. A beast of burden. You know, we might be thinking to ourselves, was, was all the other options taken? All the beautiful looking horses, were those already booked up and, and taken for the week? Maybe people have said to you before that during Jesus' day that royalty rode, don rode donkeys. And to the best of our knowledge, it seems like when royalty rode donkeys, that was earlier on. 
Maybe in the days of King David and the, the days of King Solomon, but not at Jesus' day. During Jesus' day, there were proud kings that, wore the, that rode the war horses, that rode these mighty stallions as a display, as a show, as a symbolism of the power that is theirs. And then there comes our king, who chooses a donkey. Once again, don't be mistaken, our God does all things for a reason. He's a God of order. So why did he pick a donkey? Well, first and foremost, maybe a minor point is because Jesus isn't all about the show. Jesus isn't all about the pomp that they are and, and showing off his power. He uses it, but when he does, it has purpose. And it's not for himself, it's for the glory of God and to serve you and to me, to serve me. So it's not for this show. And another reason why Jesus chose this donkey was because it was written. Jesus, Jesus chose a donkey because it was written by the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is reminding us why he came. As he said, for truly I tell you until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. The law there is the law and the gospel, the Old Testament, the word in its entirety. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to leave and go back to heaven till everything that was written about the Savior has been accomplished in me. Because if I don't accomplish it, then I am not your Savior. So Jesus needed to fulfill the most minute detail. The smallest, most insignificant, seemingly insignificant, inconsequential detail Jesus needed to fulfill because he was and is the Messiah. Down to the very minute detail of even the animal upon which he rode into Jerusalem that day. A great reminder that Jesus is our Messiah in the minor details and in the greatest ones. A great reminder why Jesus came to fulfill all scripture. To be our Messiah, to be our Savior from sin. This is the Messiah these people praise that Palm Sunday as he approached Jerusalem. As the verse is right, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Maybe I'm the only one, and that's okay if I am, but am I the only one that has ever looked at these verses and said, really? Is that it? We're talking about the king, not just any king. We're not talking about any ruler. We're talking about the ruler, the king of the universe, and the creator of the whole world. And this is his parade. This is his show. And what do they got to show for it? Some palm branches and some garments of clothing. It made me think back to some of the greatest parades in the history of the world, some of the priciest parades that this world has ever known. And I found out that one of the priciest parades to this day is a parade I'm sure every single one of you have seen. It's the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Over, I believe, 50 million people watch it on TV. Tens of thousands of people show up in person. You all know what the annual budget is for that parade? Over $15 million. It costs over $500,000 for some of those big, uh, uh, the big floats to just to blow them up with the helium. So you think of the millions of dollars, the thousands of volunteers, the candy, the confetti, the parade, everything that goes into that. And what do they have to show for the king of the world? Some garments of clothing and some palm branches. And you know who wasn't disappointed about it? Jesus. The king. Because those were wonderful demonstrations of their love. Because that's all they had. 
That was the best of the best that they had to give. You know, we often let the $3.99 t-shirts at Walmart remind us just how uh, uh, blessed we are. Garments at that time were everything. They were laying them down for Jesus to walk over. Might as well themselves lay on the ground. They were showing a tremendous amount of praise and honor and reverence to their king, to the Messiah. Crying out to him that day, blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord, who brings peace on heaven and on earth. It's a beautiful day for us to behold. It's a joyous day for us to witness. You want to know the most difficult thing about that day? You know, it's the, the most difficult thing about us watching and witnessing that? Is that it would soon all come to an end. And I'm not talking about Jesus' life, because we know that that would soon end too. But I'm talking about their praise for the king. Because remember that a large number of the people in the crowd that day, that were shouting with utter and utmost joy and excitement, praise be to the king who comes into the name of the Lord, were going to be the ones that were shouting with the same amount of excitement, only days later, crucify him. Not Barabbas, we want Jesus dead. How could they have such a drastic shift so quickly in only a matter of days? Because we're told why they were shouting so loud that day. We're told the reason why they put their hope in this king and the kind of king that they wanted. They'd seen a glimpse through Jesus of the glory days of their ancestors. They had seen through their miracles, the miracles of Jesus, just a glimpse of what David and Solomon in their minds were doing in the kingdom that they led. And they were thinking to themselves, oh yes, this is the king that we will follow. This is the king that will defeat all of our enemies, that will take down the Roman Empire, and will make life cushy and good for the rest of our life. This is the kind of king that we want. But when Jesus stopped looking like the king they wanted, they stopped worshiping him as such. When Jesus was pretty much stripped naked in front of Pilate, and they placed a crown on his head and robes on his back, that's when they had had enough. Because we know that it was an actual crown, and it was an actual robe for a king. It was a torture device. A crown of thorns plunged into his head. And a robe, not a fit for a king, but a robe fit to mock him. That's when they had had enough. That's when they not only abandoned him, but demanded that he be put to death. Because he was not the king that they wanted. Has that ever happened for you? Jesus hasn't been the king that you have created in your head. He's not been the kind of king that you want. He hasn't followed the orders that you've written down clearly for him. Your suggestions for him on a page. You're left thinking to yourself, Jesus, if you're the king and I'm your follower, shouldn't my life look better? You think about it, the followers of some of the greatest kings and conquerors of the history of the world. What happened when they followed that king? There was change. Things got better. Things looked better. Their bellies were filled and life got easier. We automatically need to think to ourselves, that's what I should have. Lord, if you have the power over death, why do my loved ones keep dying? Lord, if you are the master physician, the healer of all things, why do I continue to get sick? Why do the people that I love continue to face ailments and illnesses and diseases? Why and when are you going to wash those all away? Lord, if you have the power to do all things, when are you going to start doing all things just a little bit better? How often on a daily basis, each and every single one of us questions the king that we have and questions the things that he is doing. And our Savior wants us to remind us today, my son, my daughter, that, that template that you have in your mind of, of what a king should look like and the kingdom that they should be ruling over and what it means for those that preside and reside in that kingdom, all of that, I'm doing better. 
Go back to that beast that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that day. A donkey. You know the title that those animals are usually given? A, a beast of burden. Studies have shown that if you're a hiker, I'm sure you've witnessed this yourself, if you've gone on a hike with, with you or your family or people, you've gone with the donkey or mule, you've understood just how much they can carry. The average donkey can carry up to 300 pounds for an entire day. Some of them can carry for an amount of time a thousand pounds, sometimes which weighs more than they do. These animals are bred to carry heavy loads, to carry heavy burdens. Think about it, that day, that Palm Sunday, the beast of burden was carrying the king of burdens. That's why the king came, to carry your burdens and to carry your loads, and most of all, to carry your sin so that you and I could have peace. There's an old African phrase, I guess, that goes, peace is costly, but it's worth the expense. You think about the cost of peace for our Savior, the cost that Jesus had to pay so that you and I could have peace. It was not him taking up a crown of glory, it was not him putting on robes to be displayed for the world to see. It was him taking all of his perfection, all of his righteousness, all of his glory, and setting it to the side, and instead replacing it with every ounce of our sin. Placing a crown of shame, placing all of our shame and sin on his back, and paying for it in full. Jump to the last verses of our lesson for today. Jesus is standing, looking over Jerusalem, and, and you see what he does. After all the shouting stops, Jesus is left sobbing. For two reasons. Because he knows what is going to happen, and what he knows what that means for many people. Because Jesus knows what's going to happen when he goes into Jerusalem. It's the same thing that happened to all of the prophets that he sent to Jerusalem before. They're going to be beaten and mistreated and ultimately put to death. Jesus wants to see no one perish. But Jesus knew in those tears was the reality that this punishment that he was going to take on meant our peace meant our salvation, meant our sins were paid for in full. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you don't ride a donkey in times of war. You ride a horse. And Jesus was going to go to war when he went into Jerusalem. He was going to face the devil. He was going to face the sin that we have committed head on and taken on himself in full. He was going to go to war on our behalf. But it's almost as if Jesus was calling a shot like Babe Ruth. It's almost like Jesus was giving us a glimpse of what was going to be ours by the end of this week. Absolute and eternal peace. Because the victory would be won. You think of what Jesus saw as he overlooked Jerusalem. He saw Herod's palace. He saw Pilate's temple. He saw the places he needed to go. He saw the Garden of Gethsemane. And ultimately, off in a distance, he saw it. The cross with his name on it. But if he looked a little bit further, he could see that too. He could see the sign, the demonstration, the clear example that the victory has been won. The empty tomb where he lay. The place that shows without a matter of a shadow of a doubt that your sins and my sins have been paid for in full. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, our King is often not the King that we want. He's often not the King that we've dreamed up in our minds, that we've written down on pages and of paper. He's so much better than that. You think of the examples of kings that we have in history. A lot of great kings, a lot of great conquerors, some of them almost conquered the entire known world. You want to know the reality for all those kings? <coughs> Almost every one of them is dead or is going to die, and they're going to stay dead. 
And no matter how great their kingdom was, whether it was during their lifetime or afterwards, that kingdom crumbled. Brothers and sisters in Christ, your king lives. You do not serve a dead king. You do not serve a king that has been conquered. You serve a king whose kingdom lasts forever. A king better than you and I could ever dream of. So as Christians, today and always, we do not say it's good to be king. Instead, we say it's good that Christ is king. Because we know that we could not have done what he did. We know that we don't deserve the kingdom that he has given to us. We know that he's better than anything that we could dream up. And in the meantime, brothers and sisters in Christ, remember where your king is. Your king lives. Your king reigns. Your king rules. And he is sitting on the throne. Waiting to bring you back home. In the meantime, he's called us to wait. In the meantime, he's called us to lay down our palm branches and garments and serve him whatever way possible, knowing that he has won for us the salvation free and clear. Every letter, every stroke of the pen, every law that was demanded of us, your king has done. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the meantime, as we wait for his second coming, as we wait for the utter and absolute victory that he is going to win for us, we say this day and always, it's not good to be king, but it's good that Jesus is. Long live the king. Amen.